So this is Mars Direct 3.0. My name is Miguel Gurrea. I am from the Mars Society of Spain. I'm a collaborator there. And I'm going to present Mars Direct 3.0, which is based on work by SpaceX and Dr. Rob Zuprin. Uh, first of all, I have to thank uh, Gustavo Igon and Juan Rodriguez for having developed the animation, especially for this presentation. Uh, you will see that they are very, very good. Uh, so thank you very much to them. So what is Mars Direct 3.0? Well, it's a proposal for a general architecture for the first Mars mission using SpaceX technology. Um, it's designed to be safe, flexible, and resilient. These three things are um, different, different ways to say the same thing, which is that, let's be real, if the astronauts die in the first mission, it would be a terrible loss, and also it would be very hard to get support for future Mars missions, so it's extremely important that the astronauts return safe. And it also has to be affordable so that the trip actually does happen. Um, so how did this start? Um, this all started back in 1990 when Robert Zubrin presented Mars Direct 1.0. Um, it unfortunately didn't happen. And then in 2016, SpaceX presented their plan, which introduced the ship that, it, that is now known as Starship. And it didn't focus too much on the de details on what to do once on Mars, uh, but it did give a very good overview on, on the ship they're planning on using. Um, so then in 2019, uh, Dr. Suprin presented Mars Direct 2.0, which was mostly a revision of SpaceX's plan uh, rather than his original plan. So Mars Direct 3.0 gets ideas from these three plans and also adds um, some or original ideas. So let's start with uh, SpaceX's plan. As uh, all of you may know, they use uh, a Starship to launch people from the Earth, get them to land on Mars, refuel on Mars, getting water ice from the ground and CO2 from the atmosphere refueling the ship, coming back to Earth in the same starship. So what are the, uh, the advantages of this plan? Well, it's a huge ship, uh, so you can take a lot of cargo and also a ca cargo that is big in volume. Uh, so that's uh, something very good to say about uh, the starship. But it also comes with some disadvantages. Um, the main one is that it requires a lot of power to refuel. So it's 342 kilowatts, according to uh, Dr. Subin's cal calculations. And I, uh, have, I have also read estimates that it's around eight cargo starships worth of solar panels to install. So that's something to consider. And it also requires ice mining and processing to get people back. So if uh, I know it's 19th century industrial technology, but um, there's many things that could go wrong. They could not find the water. It could be contaminated. Some of the machinery could, could malfunction. Um, so that's a, a big risk factor. So what is Mars Direct 2.0? I'm going to get the translunar injection version. So it's basically the same thing as SpaceX's plan, except for the fact that there's a new vehicle, that's a mini Starship, that separates from Starship in translunar injection, and then that's the ship that completes the trip to and back from Mars. And that's where the crew is. Uh, so here we have a uh, good animation. Some bits are stolen from SpaceX videos. Uh, but now we'll start to see some original animations. Um, so this is basically what um, Mars Direct 2.0 would look like. And small spoiler, this will also happen in Mars Direct 3.0. But then this, this is the ship that then proceeds to go to Mars. So what are the advantages of this plan? Well, it's a cheaper vehicle that's sent to Mars for three years and not being uh, able to be reused. But the most important advantage is that it requires less power and fuel uh, to come back. However, it also comes with some disadvantages, which is less mass and size for cargo. It still requires size mining and processing to get people back. And it, then there's the cost and time of developing another vehicle. So even though it requires less power, uh, you can also take less solar panels. Um, launching from TLI means you can take more solar panels per amount of power you, that you need, but you, uh, it's still a, a problem. Um, so now let's start with Mars Direct 3.0 and we'll start with uh, best of all, both worlds and making the mini starship simpler and cheaper. So best of both worlds, why not use both? Uh, SpaceX has already said that they're planning on leaving the first starships on the surface. So why not use the bigger starship for cargo and then the smaller starship for crew? That way uh, you can have more volume and mass uh, of equipment and you need less power and less fuel 
to refill uh, the mini starship. So the, yeah, that's the first thing that this architecture introduces. We will use both ships. Um, here we, we can see a comparison because this mini starship will be a bit different from the one that um, Mr. Subrin originally proposed. And it has two key differences. So the first one is that, um, I'll get into this a bit later, but uh, Dr. Subrin's uh, mini starship would get back to the Earth's atmosphere. It would re-enter from, from interplanetary space, which is a very, very hot re-entry. And so it would need a very thick heat shield. Uh, it's going to land on, on Earth, so it, it will need an atmospheric Raptor engine. And the mini starship version two, which is the one uh, that's going to be used for Mars Direct 3.0, if all goes well, let's be optimistic. Uh, this ship would not re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and it can use a thinner heat shield that that's just uh, meant to re-enter Mars. Um, it would only need one Raptor vacuum engine, which is good enough for landing on Mars's thin atmosphere. So here we have a reduction in cost and in development. Uh, so that may be good to convince uh, Musk to take this approach. So I said, I said that the ship didn't need to re-enter uh, the Earth's atmosphere. So how is that possible? Well, instead of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, it could have some excess fuel or do an orbital maneuvering around the moon or aero braking, but the ship needs to get into Earth orbit, even if it's a very eccentric orbit. And then once it's in orbit, you'll see, you can see now a mini starship lifting off from Mars. Then a starship that's waiting for it in orbit, that this ship that's designed to actually have the mini starship inside of it is waiting there and grabs it, it stores it in its cargo bay, bay and then uh, the, the big starship with the mini starship inside of it lands on Earth. So that way it uses its own heat shield and you do not need to take uh, a big heat shield to Mars and back. And you also have a more tested and more reliable ship that's landing people on the ground. So that's how you avoid the interplanetary reentry of the mini starship. So what vehicles and technologies are needed for Mars Direct 3.0? Well, first you have the Starship cargo for orbit uh, and surface. Then you have on-orbit refueling for getting to translunar injection. And then you have to develop the mini Starship. So let's compare SpaceX's plan to Mars Direct 3.0. SpaceX has, uh, Elon has said that they're planning on launching two cargo Starships on the first launch window. And then in the, in the next launch window, they're planning on launching another two cargo uh, ships and two crewed ships. So to show this, this is not something extremely unaffordable. This is going to be one big starship and one small starship in each launch window. It could be more, but in principle, these four ships would be enough. Please pay, pay attention to the names. I have named each of these ships with the name uh, of Spanish vessels. Here, a bit representing Spain. So uh, what better names for the ships getting to the new world? So let's see the first launch window. Uh, which would be Starship Victoria, which is uh, the first ship to travel around the Earth. So here we see a simple animation of this cargo Starship, which would be the first to land on Mars. So yes, here, as I told you before, it's named after the now ship Victoria, the first to circle the world. So this ship is the main ISIU element. It's a fuel facility. So it's not that it contains all the elements that will have to be deployed on the ground. No, it's all integrated. So it's all inside of it. So this is the main ISIU element. It will contain a CO2 collector and electrolyzer, a water electrolyzer, a Savatier machine, a hydrogen tank, and a solar uh, panel rover. Uh, it's important to focus on this hydrogen tank. Uh, this is a concept res uh, being rescued from uh, Master Egg uh, 1.0, because I think it's the best idea in that system um, for safety, which is you launch the hydrogen needed to produce the fuel just with uh, Martian CO2, no need to uh, refuel with water ice. This would be for safety on the first missions and this hydrogen tank launched on a Starship would have enough uh, hydrogen to produce the fuel for the return trip of two mini Starships. So here we have the second ship that we would be launched in the first launch window, which would be the mini Starship Pinta. This would be an uncrewed ship and it would demonstrate the ability of, uh, of the mini Starship to land on Mars. Uh, it's named after one of Columbus's caravel ships, the first to actually return to Spain. It just contains a CO2 collector and electrolysis 
uh, fertilizer and supplies for for the return trip because this uh, may be the vessel they use to come back. So after the two ships are landing uh, landed, the uh, solar panel rover starts deploying uh, solar panels around Starship Victoria, and then Starship Victoria will have to use that power to produce uh, fuel from the Martian CO2 uh, and the hydrogen that it has stored using the Sabatier reaction. So before the astronauts launch, they will already have enough fuel there for hopefully more than enough for the return trip. So uh, yes, this is the second uh, Starship. Uh, this is the second launch window, so this would be two years later. It's also named after one of Columbus's caravel ships, the Niña. This would actually be the first crew mission, and it's important to know that it would take the six-month three-return trajectory, not just for safety, uh, but also for all the reasons that we'll see later. So this contains a CO2 collector and electrolyzer to produce oxygen for the astronauts, a field transport rover that's going to be important, and six to eight astronauts. So um, this would land some distance away from the other ships, not to damage solar panels or any other equipment. And then after that, uh, we'll get later into the second ship that's launching this launch window. But once the ship is landed, phase one would start, which would be planting the flag, doing basic science, transporting fuel and doing the initial exploration. So as you can see here, the ship deploys uh, this rover, the fuel transport rover. Uh, which they will use to transport fuel from Starship Victoria, which has already more than enough fuel for the return trip in its tanks. So it's taken from the big Starship to the small Starship, the first to arrive, which is Pinta. So the other ship that was launching in the second launch window is Starship Santa Maria, which is also named after one of Columbus's ships. And this one uh, uh, was actually scrapped in America to be turned into the first settlement. This one takes the seven and a half month trip, which means it will arrive one and a half months after the astronauts have landed. We'll see later why that's important. This contains the first basic habitat, ice mining equipment, and a pressurized rover, and maybe more solar panels. So here we can see the ship landing, uh, safe distance away from the others. And this would be the last ship to arrive. Maybe it could be more ships, but this is just meant to represent the plan should be enough with one. So then uh, once the ship has landed, phase two would start, which would be exploration, uh, ice mining and base deployment. So the, uh, the uh, pressurized rover would deploy, which they could use to explore long distance locations. Then they can start uh, mining for ice, because yes, they will do that. It's just that they do not depend on that, on that for their survival. Hopefully they'll, they'll start producing fuel there and they, they will deploy, uh, if all goes well, the, the initial habitat, which they could use to live there for the last months of the, of the trip. So I said this plan uh, needed to be safe. So this plan is prepared to survive in many, many scenarios, uh, engine ship failures and many, let, let's, let's start with it. So let's start easy. What if the any of the first two ships crash? Well, this one's easy. The crew would never leave the Earth because they wouldn't have launched it yet and the crew would be alive. Same thing if the CO2 ISRU and fuel production does not work. If Starship Victoria is unable to produce fuel with CO2 and the hydrogen it has inside, the astronauts would never leave the Earth so no one would die. So what if ice mining ISRU doesn't work? Well, if this was SpaceX's plan or Mars Direct 2.0, the astronauts would die. Because if they cannot mine ice, they have no way of producing the fuel they need to return to Earth. Um, so unfortunately, that would be in the death of the astronauts. But in this case, they already have enough fuel there produced with the hydrogen and the CO2 for the return trip. So the crew would survive the trip, no problem. Uh, this was actually a great concept from Master Rake 1.0. So what if the last uh, ship to come, uh, the Starship Santa Maria, crashes? Well, it would mean no ice mining, no pressurized rover, and no initial hab, which would be a sad day, no doubt. But this is not a mission critical element, so the crew would still be able to return to Earth. So what if the cruise ship crashes? Well, okay, there's no way around this, okay? Um, this is the only ship that actually needs to land 
or else the, uh, the crew would die. Okay, there's no way around this. But what if the cruise ship lands, but it lands far away? Well, it would be a very weird trajectory if it landed on the other side of Mars. But uh, let's imagine it lands, for example, 400 kilometers away. Well, they would start phase one as normal. They would plant the flag, do basic science around the place. And then Starship Santa Maria, which is the one that's still one and a half months from landing on Mars, would, ch would change its trajectory ever so slightly to land next to it. And it would deploy the pressurized rover and then the crew could take the pressurized rover to reach the other uh, two ships and the propellant they need to return home. So once again, the crew would, would survive the situation. What if the return ship, which is Pinta, is found to be damaged? Well, there's no problem because the crew has two mini starships on Mars ready to come back. So the crew would just use um, the mini starship they used to land, which is Nina, um, as the return trip. So again, even if that ship explodes, they, they still have a backup. So let's get to uh, one of the most feared situations on a human uh, Mars mission, which is a global dust storm. And we're assuming a very tough situation, which is no nuclear power, uh, because this is the preferred solution to this problem. But some say space, SpaceX will not get their hands on fissionable material. So unless NASA develops uh, their killer power and puts it at their disposal, we're going to assume just solar panels. So what will happen in this case? Solar panels will be enabled to get energy from the sun. So the crew would use fuel cells to burn the, the excess methalox and power basic life support systems. So as I told you, Starship Victoria uh, had produced more than enough fuel for the return trip. And so they could just burn some of that fuel to power the basic life support systems. So if it just lasted for, let's say, one or two months or even three, uh, the crew would be able to survive running on methalox. So if everything goes well, the astronauts would return safely to Earth. They would bring uh, important samples with them, which would be analyzed on Earth. Science and exploration will have been done on the surface of Mars. Ice mining and ice you will have been uh, tested on the surface. Hopefully it will have gone all right. Fuel for future missions will already be there if there's some leftovers and they have produced fuel from the ice and the initial base will have been deployed. So this will uh, set the first stones for a sustainable settlement on the surface of Mars. Certainly uh, further missions could continue with uh, the development of the, of the base, but this would be very good things to leave behind on the first mission. So this is it, this is the end of the presentation, but I would just like to say one thing before we turn to questions. And it's that I'm part of the committee organizing the European Mars Conference for 2021. It was originally going to be this year's European conference, but due to COVID-19, we have had to let it slip to next year. So if all goes well and the pandemic is out, we will be having this event in Madrid in 2021 maybe in October, November, something like that. So if you're interested, it'll be great to have you in the conference. So I would also like to say that uh, I know Elon wants big ships going to Mars and back. So I think the mini Starship is important for the first missions to make sure that the problem of, of the fuel and the energy is solved. But uh, once the, the initial base build production is working well with the ice, then the mini Starship will probably not be necessary anymore. Uh, but I think it's madness to start with the big starship because it requires so much power to refuel. So this is it. If any of you wants to uh, make any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Hi, Miguel. Thank you. Um, I have, I'll go ahead and just read off some questions that I've seen in chat here. Um, I don't have an official account uh, today. There's a bit of a uh, last minute change to available volunteers. But the uh, first question uh, we have here is, uh, what gave you the idea to start working on Mars Direct 3.0? Well, thank you for the question. It's a very good one. Well, to be honest, uh, when I first watched Superman present Mars Direct 2.0, I didn't like the idea because I, I, it would mean a huge volume and cargo reduction. And it will also make the, the development time longer. So I actually offered uh, Subin to debate him on the European Mars Conference of 2019. 
there was no time on the schedule. But um, I started thinking about that, and I actually uh, there was one day I was going to sleep, and then this idea came to mind, uh, and I was sleepless until 4 a.m. until all the idea was fully developed. This was um, one year ago, more or less. Um, so I wrote it the next morning, and I decided to present it when I had the chance to present it here. But yeah, there was a, this was a, a sleepless night. I had the first idea of simplifying the, the mini starship uh, with um, this maneuver here at the, first, uh, uh, the start of the presentation, um, just recoupling back on low Earth orbit, which I think uh, it's uh, all this way. Uh, so yeah, this was the first idea that made me think about uh, Mars Direct 3.0. And then um, I wanted to develop um, on what actually happens on the surface of Mars uh, to make it more safer because SpaceX uh, just focused on uh, on the ship, which is great. They're focusing just on that. Um, and Dr. Subin introduced the, the good idea of the mini starship. Um, so I, I wanted to add, apart from the idea of um, recoupling with the big starship on low Earth orbit, I wanted to add a plan for the first mission. Yeah, this was just a, a, a sleepless night. Uh, and I'm great, grateful to have the opportunity to present here. Gotcha. And do you have the actual dimensions on the mini starship? Like how much cargo can it, can it carry in comparison to a full-size starship, uh, um, especially when it involves crew? Yes. Uh, well, um, um, this, the volume would be constrained by the volume of the cargo bay of the Starship because it has to fit inside. And in the numbers, I would have to refer you to Dr. Shubin's presentation because the mini Starship idea is inherited from, from his and he has the calculations on his presentations. You can find them online quite easily. You just have to look for Master 2.0 and he explains, he gives all the numbers. I, I just had 25 minutes to present this, so I didn't get uh, deep into the numbers. But yeah, it, it's the same thing, it's, except it's going to be lighter uh, because it will have, uh, it, will, it will not need uh, atmospheric engines and it will need the lighter heat shield. But uh, apart from that, it's going to be uh, Dr. Dr. Zubrin's calculations. Dr. Zubrin also gave updated version of those calculations for the space tube. Sure, what about it? Um, so it, it might also be worth looking at that if someone was looking for dimensions of the mini starship. But yeah, it's just the, the cargo bay of the starship. Gotcha. And would the crew launch inside the mini starship while the main starship launched? Or how exactly um, would that work? Yes, yeah, so th they would launch inside the mini starship, which would be inside of a starship. We have to remember that the Starship does not have an abort system either, so it's not less safe than a normal launch. So yes, it would just launch. Uh, this is a crude version of the Starship, it didn't have another video. But yeah, this, it will launch normally inside the Starship and then uh, the mini Starship with the crew uh, inside of it would deploy and go for Mars. Gotcha. How are you, would you clear the solar panels that the robot deploys uh, from sand and dust? That's a good question too. Uh, I was actually, it, it was, this was a topic of conversation between me and Gustavo, who's one of the designers. He's the one that designed that rover. So I actually, one of the things that we changed is that I suggested leaving some space between the rows of solar panels and this rover would have, these are just preliminary designs. These are things he designed, but uh, this could look totally different. But the rubber below it, it would have some things to clean it, like um, air pumps or something like that. Um, so yeah, this rubber would go over the solar panels and hopefully clean them up. Or just like uh, rubber opportunity, some dust devils could uh, ease the job for us here. But yes, that's the idea. Would there be a scenario where the mini starship could itself could land on Earth? Or was it only designed to land on Mars? Um, well, uh, if, if this was Mars Direct 2.0, uh, the mini starship would be designed to land on Earth. But in, in this case, uh, the idea is to have a thinner heat shield and no atmosphere, uh, atmospheric uh, Raptor engine. Um, 
to make it all simpler. So this version of the mini starship would not be able to land on Earth. It would air break on Earth to slow itself down to get into Earth orbit, but it would not be able to land on Earth. On Earth, it would burn and blow up. So you had to transfer the crew from the mini starship to another vehicle to, to land. So like a full size starship. Um, not exactly. It would not need um, crew transfer. It would just um, it's back here. Um, it would just need to get inside the starship. So the the crew would be um, no. What? Oh, so it would re it would redock with the starship to land. I see. Yes, that's the idea. The, the crew would launch from Mars in this mini starship. Uh, then the starship would travel to Mars. It would slow down. Um, and once in Earth orbit, it would the crew would still be in, inside of here. They would uh, dock with the starship, it would close, and then this whole thing uh, would land on Earth with the crew inside. That's the idea. Gotcha. Okay, got a couple questions here. Uh, we had some questions on the fact there's only a single Raptor on the mini starship. Is there any idea or possibility of using two Raptors in case of redundancy for, you know, if one were to fail during landing? Um, that's a good question. It's a bit tricky because if you have two engines, like, uh, for example, this version, uh, I imagine how Superman's version would look like having to have a vacuum engine. But let's imagine you have two engines and this one fails. Um, the one at the bottom would not be in the center of mass, so it would the the, the ship would uh, unbalance. So it would not help to have uh, two engines. So they would have to rely on one engine because in this case, if either of the two engines fail, um, it would be doomed anyway. So having two engines would probably not help with redundancy. Okay, and I had the last question I think we got time for, because it's almost the end here, is a yep. question on failures of the solar panels. Um, do you know how many solar panels could fail and you could still reliably produce the amount of fuel needed? Or is there some kind of mitigation plan for maybe bringing extra solar panels? Um, yes, so the idea is that, well, first of all, this is going to be very safe because if there is not enough fuel produced on the surface of Mars for the crew to return before they launch, they will not launch. Okay, so it's not something that could risk the astronauts. But the idea is to take, uh, obviously, ha have some margin, have uh, more solar panels than you need. Um, because there's also going to be dust on top of them. So uh, that uh, a calculation would need to be done on on that, on calculating how much dust is going to be on top of it and how much you need, um, how many could fail. Uh, solar panels are quite quite a reliable reliable technology. Uh, but yeah, that could be a problem. So yeah, you would probably need to take more than, than you need. So I think that's all we have time for. So thank you very much for um, watching this presentation. If you're interested, interested in contacting me, you can do so at these two um, Twitter accounts. Um, and thank you for, for listening. Goodbye. Right. Thank you very much.